So welcome to this next part of the BMAT series. If you want to catch the entire series here where we're talking about all the little bits of info that you need to know about the BMAT before we dive into the kind of nitty gritty of how to score well and the kind of learning aspects that are gonna help you score highly. So today we're gonna to look at the basics of the exam, what you need to know in terms of the curriculum, the mark scheme, and just topics that you need to have knowledge of. If you feel like you already know that stuff and just want to dive straight into the techniques and best ways to score highly, check out this playlist here where I go through each section and all of the best techniques to do well in that. So I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about the test format. As you probably already know, it's a two hour test and it's divided into three sections. So the first is a section called thinking skills, which is all questions relating to problem solving and critical thinking. So these are 32 multiple choice questions that are gonna last an hour for this section. Section two is scientific knowledge and its applications. So that is everything from biology, physics, chemistry, and maths that you will have learned in school up to the age of 16. So if in the UK, everything that you've done at GCSE level will have been covered that you should know about by that stage. If you are not from the UK, if you've done iGCSE, that will have the same material, but not to worry if you haven't done the GCSEs because literally most schools will have covered the same sort of material that is gonna be covered in that section of the BMAT. Now this one is 27 multiple choice questions and you only have 30 minutes for this section. Section three is the dreaded writing task, where it says it tests your ability to select, develop and organize ideas and to communicate them in writing concisely and effectively. So you will get three questions questions to choose from, but you only choose one of those three questions to spend 30 minutes writing an answer to. And I think it's worth very quickly just showing you the content specifications that you need to know to make sure you've got all the subjects that you're aware of that are going to come up in the BMAT. So I'm going to quickly show you the purpose of the test, the qualities that are assessed in you, and the knowledge that you need to have. So the purpose of the biomedical admissions test is solely to provide an assessment of candidates' potential to succeed on an academically demanding undergraduate biomedical degree course. It is not designed to assess fitness to practice, which universities will assess in their own way. The test results are intended to be used as one component of the medical school selection process in conjunction with other information available to the admissions tutors. Test items draw upon general academic skills and basic science knowledge rather than recent specialist teaching. The test provides an objective basis for comparing candidates from different backgrounds, including mature applicants and those from different countries. The test is designed to be challenging in order to differentiate effectively between able applicants for university courses including those who might have achieved the highest possible grades in school examinations. So then they break down the qualities that need to be assessed in two bits, skills and knowledge. In terms of knowledge, they want familiarity with concepts, terms and knowledge typically covered by non-specialist courses in science and mathematics, usually taught in secondary education. And then when it comes to the skills, they're testing your ability to do all of the following. So if you want to have a look at an example of a past paper, have a look in the description below where I've given a link to one of them. But let's take a deeper dive into each section and the structure of each individual part of this test. So section one, as we said, the thinking skills, which makes up 50% of this entire exam. This is the element that tests generic skills often required for undergraduate study. The range of these and the appropriate balance between them in terms of number of marks available is outlined in what I'm going to show you now in the mark scheme. So as I said previously, these questions are in multiple choice format and also important to know that you are not allowed to use a calculator. So we'll look in more depth at those two elements of the thinking skills section, which is problem solving and critical thinking. Now, if you've sat the UCAT, you can think of the problem solving a bit more like the decision making or maybe the abstract reasoning of the UCAT test. Whereas for the critical thinking, you can think of it more like the verbal reasoning. So the problem solving requires candidates to solve problems using simple numerical operations. Problem solving requires the capacity to select relevant information, identify similarities, and determine and apply appropriate procedures. Whereas the critical thinking presents a series of logical arguments and requires respondents to summarize conclusions, draw conclusions, identify assumptions, assess the impact of additional evidence, detect reasoning errors, match arguments, and apply principles. So let's look a little closer now at section two, which is 30 minutes of scientific knowledge and its applications. Section two tests whether candidates have an appropriate level of core scientific knowledge and 
and the ability to apply it. Questions will be restricted to material typically included in non-specialist science and mathematics courses in secondary education. The balance between the subject areas in terms of time and marks available is outlined in the curriculum that I'm about to show you. Again, this is in multiple choice format and again, calculators can't be used for this part. Speed and accuracy is really important for this section. One important thing that you need to know is that of the 27 questions, you get one mark awarded for each correct answer, but there is no negative marking, which means that you don't get a mark deducted if you get the answer wrong, you just get a mark awarded for every correct answer. So you should attempt all 27 of the questions in this section. And the 27 questions broken down by subject are seven for biology, seven for chemistry, seven for physics, and then six for maths. So when it comes to the subjects that you need to know for each of the sections, when it comes to biology, there are these 10 subjects that you need to know about. Then when it comes to chemistry, you have to know about all these 17 subjects. Then for physics, you need to know just these seven. And then for maths, another seven again, which is these. Another thing that's worth noting is that they expect you to understand standard international units, also known as SI units, and to be able to convert between different types of units readily. So know the equations to get from one to the other. They also expect you to have really good understanding of your prefixes. So nano, micro, milli, all the way up to mega and giga, etc. And then finally, we have section three, which is the 30 minutes for the writing task. Now to tell you exactly what happens here, this is a selection of three tasks will be available from which one must be chosen. These will include brief questions based on topics of general scientific or medical interest. The questions will provide a short proposition and may require candidates to consider one of the following tasks. Explanation of the proposition, so candidates are asked to explain the proposition or a part of it or its implications. Otherwise, they might put a statement and ask you to generate a counter argument. So candidates are asked to look at the other side of the argument by proposing or commenting on a counter argument or counter preposition. The final thing they might ask you to do with the statement is a reconciliation of the two sides. This is where candidates are asked to offer some sort of resolution or reconciliation for two opposing positions or elements of those positions explored in the answer. The writing task provides the opportunity for candidates to demonstrate the capacity to understand different sides of an opposing proposition and then communicate them effectively in writing. So when in written format, the writing task is confined to just one A4 side of paper. However, last year they did make an attempt to computerize it and put a word limit on that. However, that was a little bit of a disaster. So we'll see what they decide to do in future sittings and whether they go back to paper or go to an online format and kind of maybe tidy that up a little bit. But the idea of limiting the word count is to promote the discipline selection and organization of ideas together with their concise, accurate and effective expression. It's important to know that dictionaries or electronic spell checkers are not allowed. So the way that this is scored is that the paper is given to two separate markers. They both give it their score and then they take the average for each. I'm gonna talk about scores and what that means in a moment, but that is how they go about this writing task. When scoring responses, consideration will be given to the degree to which candidates have addressed the question in the way demanded, organized their thoughts clearly, expressed themselves using concise, compelling, and correct English, and used their general knowledge and opinions appropriately. And admitting institutions will actually be provided with a copy of the candidate's response as well. So the format of the test is that on the day, you will be given three separate test papers, one for each section. And with the exception of the writing task section three, all of them will be multiple choice questions. Each each of which for section one and two, one mark will be awarded for each correct answer. So let's talk a little bit about scoring and reporting. So for both thinking skills section one and the scientific knowledge part in section two, answer sheets are scanned and verified following by automated marking, psychometric analysis, test calibration, and the issuing of results. For section one and two, scores will be reported to one decimal place on a nine point BMAT scale. However, for the writing task, which is section three, this is marked by Cambridge assessment admissions testing examiners. Scores are reported for the quality of content on a scale of one to five, and then for the quality of English on a scale from A to E. So the highest that you can possibly get on section three of the BMAT is a five for the quality of the content and an A for the quality of English. So as we know from this video here, where we talked about all the key dates for the BMAT, we know that results come about five weeks after sitting the exam. And then you get about a week for appealing or getting them remarked. And then after that, shortly after you get the results that are sent to the institutions that you've applied to. So let's take a look at how the BMAT is actually scored. There is no pass or fail for the BMAT. You should just 
aim to get as high as you possibly can. If you check out this video here, I talk about the scores required if you want to get into the Oxbridge universities, the London universities, or the lower demanding universities that take the BMAT, which are all the rest. And just a reminder, like I said, there's no negative marking for sections one and two, so always worth having a guess. But when we look at the marking itself, so section one, the thinking skills is one mark per question. And then the raw marks are converted into a BMAT scale, which is one all the way up to nine, nine being the highest. It's also the same for section two about the scientific knowledge. So again, one mark per correct answer and then converted to a one to nine scale, nine being the highest. Just to give you an idea, when you're applying to Oxbridge, you really want to be aiming for a combined score of section one and two, which the maximum you can get is 18. To get into Oxford and Cambridge, you probably need to be aiming for about a 14. If you want to find out how to do that, my online program now has got several people into the Oxbridge Medical Schools, and we can show you exactly how to get a 14 plus if you need it in the BMAT. So if you want to check out exactly how we help people one-on-one -on -one to achieve those ridiculous scores needed to get into those really competitive universities, you can check this video out here where you can find out more about the program and exactly how we help people. And then finally, section three, as we said, so it's a maximum score of five for the quality of answer from one to five. And then the quality of English is anything from A to E, A being the highest. You really want to be getting a 3A, 3B or above to be getting into Oxbridge type universities. So if you're aiming for the highest possible score in section three, here are some of the things that you need to consider that the markers will ask themselves when going through your paper. So when markers are looking at the quality of the content of your answer, they'll be asking themselves the following three questions. Has the candidate addressed the question in the way demanded? Have they organized their thoughts clearly? Have they used their general knowledge and opinions appropriately? And just to give you an idea, a score of five, this is the kind of benchmark that they want to see. An excellent answer with no significant weaknesses all aspects of the question are addressed, making excellent use of the material and generating an excellent counter proposition or argument. The argument is cogent, ideas are expressed in a clear and logical way considering a breadth of relevant points and leading to a compelling synthesis or conclusion. And just to give you an idea of the opposite end of the spectrum, an answer judged to be irrelevant, trivial, unintelligible or missing should be given a score of zero. And then when it comes to the quality of English, markers will be assessing whether candidates have expressed themselves clearly using concise, compelling, and correct English. And again, I'll run you through what constitutes getting an A, i.e. the top score. So for a band A, they want to see good use of English. So fluent, good sentence structure, good use of vocabulary, sound use of grammar, good spelling and punctuation, and very few slips or errors. Contrast that to a band E, which is rather weak use of English, hesitant fluency, not easy to follow at times, some flawed sentence structure and paragraphing, limited range of vocabulary, faulty grammar, regular spelling or punctuation, errors, regular and frequent slips or errors. And you'll see on the mark scheme, which I've linked to in the description below, that although you can get A, B, C, D or E for your mark for the quality of English, they have only given you parameters for A, C and E. But that's fine because they're basically working out whether you lie directly in the A bucket, directly in the C bucket, or maybe somewhere in between, which is where they would award a B for that. And they specifically say that if you cross something out or add a section later, that they should ignore that and they should judge the quality of the resultant English, so the final product. So although we say that the lowest score is a 1E, you can actually get a 0X if it's really that bad or you haven't written anything at all. Like I say, if you check out that playlist, if you hit this information button here, you can see all the videos that I've made that are gonna help you score highly in the BMAT. And don't worry if you go through all of those and maybe go through my online course where I go into a lot more depth in all of these if you want to score really highly you can make sure that you don't even have to worry about those low scores because I'll give you all the methods that you need to make sure that you're aiming for that kind of 14 plus 5A sort of status. So how the BMAT is used varies depending on the university, but if you click on that information and have a look at one of the videos in there, I've actually broken down university by university exactly how they use the BMAT. I've looked at not only how they mark it, but how that fits in with the wider picture of how they use it in their selection process for potential medical students. And before we wrap up, I'll go through some common questions that I get asked about the BMAT. The first one is usually about access arrangements and extra time. Yes, access arrangements are available if you have a disability or special requirement and are entitled to support for other exams. So examples of access arrangements include, but are not limited to, the use of a laptop or computer. However, they did recently try and just move everybody onto a computer, so we'll see where they go with that in the future. Extra time, separate invigilation, enlarged papers or modified question paper if you need it. And if you have a look of the first video of this explanation series I did, you can see a little bit more about where you can apply for access arrangements. 
Another question that I frequently get is what's a good score? And really, like we said, you want to aim to get as high as you can. And there are certain requirements for given universities. And if you click that information button, you can see a video where I've gone through each university. But the thing to realize is that candidates are not expected to get everything right in the BMAT. So a typical candidate will get about half of the questions right. And finally, if you are not a native English speaker, the BMAT say that they require a minimum English level of B2 according to the Common European Framework of Reference for Languages or CEFA. So I hope that helps you understand the logistics of what you need to know for the BMAT. In the rest of this series, we're going to look at how to register, what to do on test day and everything about the results. If you want to see all of that, you can check out this playlist here. Otherwise, I recommend that you have a look at this video where we talk about your revision plan and how to best prepare to make sure that you get that astronomical high score that you need if you're applying to an Oxbridge University. Thanks for watching and I'll see you over in those videos.